thank you guys all for being here, um, both in person and those that are online with us. Um, at any time online, those who might be having difficulties, please let me know. I'm going to monitor the online um, chat and whatnot. Um, so if you're having difficulties hearing or whatnot, just shoot a message in the chat to me. Um, so um, I guess we've had a bit of a quiet lecture series this spring. Um, so we've had one less formal lecture uh, as part of the Breakfast in Architecture, which was focused on the theory course. But today is our first more formal lecture with out-of-town guests in person with us. Um, and this lecture is in conjunction with celebrating uh, the spring gala that the students of design are hosting. Um, so I'm just going to take a brief moment to introduce our guests to you guys, and then uh, we will welcome her to the, um, I would say stage, but um, front and center. So um, B. Yu Tan, the founder of Beta, which is B. Yu Tan Architects, is an award-winning architect recognized for her work in restoring heritage buildings in her native Penang and beyond. She established her own boutique practice focusing on honest architecture, um, sorry, and back to basics design. Her first project restoring the Penang Institute Colonial's Annex Bungalow brought her into the path of adaptive reuse. In 2019, B designed the Penang Digital Library, opening to an overwhelming public response as it became the first paperless library in the nation. The project was awarded the Alterations in Addition category gold medal at the PAM 2019, making Beta the youngest practice to win a top prize. Beta would take home another PAM gold medal two years later in the adaptive reuse category for the redesign of the Harmony Center, Penang's first interfaith communal building. Uh, BU continues to share her vision for preserving built heritage as the organi organizer of Pecha Kucha Pengnang, a global networking event that originated in Tokyo, where architects, designers, and artists share ideas. With a strong commi commitment to groom the future, Pena BU also teaches at her alma mater, the University of Malaysia, and is an honoree of the Tatler Asia's most influential 2021 and 2022. The, de the definitive list of shaping people shaping Asia. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome her up here. And uh, if you could all give her a warm welcome. Uh, graciously <laughs> introducing me in such a long list. Uh, thank you guys for coming. I didn't expect a full house because I thought we are seeing more on Zoom. Uh, also, thanks to Xiao Hu and uh, Asia is here. Uh, I travel on a 17-hour flight to come here. Uh, but yeah, 17 hours and add on eight hours of transit in San Francisco, uh, two hours to Spokane. So I think that adds up to more than 24 hours. I, I, I lost count of my sleeping patterns, but I'm glad I'm here on time today. And I'm really glad that you guys show up, you know, that's, that's really already a good support, you know. Warm, you know, applause for yourself. <laughs> for you. And I think we have a Zoom, guys. Um, so I'm going to share my story from Penang. And then uh, I definitely look forward to you guys telling me uh, what you think and then tell me whether it's relatable or not. Okay, so ready? So um, the fastest, easiest way to introduce what I do and how much I do is like, I always felt there's five of me, or I always wish there's four of me and the original me is at home, you know, with my <laughs> kids. So I was telling Amy, I have three kids. And um, so as a working mother, you know, woman to woman, we, we, we juggle, we make it happen. So I'm a practitioner, um, and almost at the same time I started my practice, I decided to try teaching. So that's two. And then uh, over the years, then I, I kind of like got bored in the initial years of my practice. So I started a, a community event, Pecha Kucha, that's three. And then, you know, uh, at the same time, I cannot forget my parents. Uh, I'm staying with my in-laws and my kids. And then, oh, then my husband as well. <laughs> so 
And then um, the students I teach, they come back, you know, they consult me, so that makes me a mentor. So I, I, I think I should add another six of me. So I wanted to say bionic women, but I think bionic women is in what? Only Xiaohu and Amy and I would know. You Google up bionic women, and it's a famous TV series. And, and I always love the visual of uh, bionic women running fast, and then it spreads into five or ten of her. Okay, so that's me. Oh, and then recently I agreed to write for a local newspaper. So that's like five or six. And this is my students. Um, I think Xiaohu and I agreed students make me make us feel young. So you guys should know that you know, you make your lectures feel young. Um, as a practitioner, I was practicing for almost 16 years before I decided to go back to teach. And with, with that experience, I, I tend to bring the practice back to the classroom. Uh, I see myself like I'm coming back from the dark side, coming back to academia world. Um, and, you know, imagine me coming back from the dark side, coming back to the classroom. I bring my students out to the dark side to meet my friends, you know, my practicing friends, my developer friends. So uh, these are my out of classroom trips. You know, I call up all my old contacts, you know, I have 50 students coming, you know, and then we'll go crash into a, a gallery, sales gallery. Uh, this is in Singapore, my former company. So this is what I do, okay? Uh, I felt it's probably interesting to share um, the power of adaptive reuse. I'm glad to see adaptive reuse already happening in Moscow, and then I see that uh, there's a strong uh, support and belief in it. So I'm going to share how uh, it has transformed our practice into what it is today. So Beta is driven from my own name, sole proprietor. So this is the spectrum of work. Many do not realize that I'm not a heritage architect from day one. I'm actually a commercial architect during my uh, working years, my consultancy years. So I was based in Singapore for four years before I went back to Penang. And there's a reason I want to show you this, okay? Uh, so I've done quite a fair bit of things. When I was young, I was really um, driven to do everything. So I made sure I've done you know, mixed development, uh, hospitality, you know, tick box, and then uh, whatever competition that's available in the office, I'll, I'll you know, volunteer. I've done retail, and these are my completed portfolio before I started my practice. Okay, so technically that makes me actually I'm a high rise uh, specialist to be honest. You know, I I've done uh, I was with a developer company for eight years where uh, we designed and built in-house you know, and then uh, in that whole eight years I completed eight hours ranging 35 to 65 so that's like massive stuff right so this is takes me to somewhere I, I'd never reveal my age but this is like late I only say late into my career then I decided that, you know, midlife crisis point of uh, a contemplation, I said, okay, maybe I should start my practice before I get too old. So I started my practice with these three uh, so-called values that are very close to my heart. Uh, being honest, that's one. Honest to yourself, because to me, uh, we tend to see a lot of pretentious design in Malaysia and Penang, meaning we try to copy a certain image from, you know, uh, a different country. And I felt we have to be honest, you know, if we are in a tropical climate, design what is in the tropical climate. And also honest to yourself. Number two is being humble. Um, family values taught me that, you know, no matter how successful you become, always stay grounded because when you forget to be humble, when you get too much of yourself, you, you stop <coughs> learning. When you think you're number one, you know, you, you, you stop learning. So that's the danger there. So number three, uh, respect. Now respect as an architect comes in many layers. Professional layer, layer is you respect your client, respect nature, respect site, respect the brief, respect the cost and budget. So this is a summary of one of my high rise project in elevation, okay? Uh, 10,000 square feet per unit. 
huge place in Penang. If you visit, you know, I can show you one condominium mm. unit, one floor itself is 10,000 square feet and sold out. And that scale of work before I start my practice and the work that I'm going to share with you today are cute scales of intimate projects. Okay. So I want to show you this because you are all going to go out and practice and become great architects soon. So you have to be prepared that you don't need to decide now, but what kind of spectrum of work do you want to work on? You know, do you want to go on high rise or do you want to go on small intimate scale? Okay. So what is adaptive reuse? I'm very impressed with this building. You guys know this, right? And um, so maybe some of you are in your first year, second year, so a little bit of a uh, revisit to strong foundation. It's all about old buildings getting a second life. Okay, so you might have been taught on this, but um, always ask why. What's the whole big deal? Why save old buildings? You know, um, why not just build new? What's the whole uh, significance of adaptive reuse? Um, I started showing these slides in my class during COVID because you remember that those days we were all looking at the graph, flattening the curve. And I, I like this comic because it's actually framed the whole future in a very um, right perspective. And we are probably off COVID now globally. You know, where are we for everyone to decide this session or but the bigger wave that's going to come is the climate crisis, right? So I'm sure most of you will realize this <coughs> climate issue, sustainability is a strong um, core value in the school, right? In your University of Idaho. So some facts to bring home to. By 2060, we will be really overbuilding due to the demand of population. And with all this over construction happening, we have to be mindful that, you know, adaptive reuse can actually reduce construction in a, in a indirect way, okay? So reduce carbon emission, save costs on demolition. Now these are very critical if you are going out to graduate like in May and you get your first client and then, you know, gives you a beautiful building, an old hundred year old building and say, can we just tear down of it? And then if you want to convince your client, then this is my free answers to you, you know. Let me tell you five reasons. So this is my five free uh, template for you okay so one for carbon emission reduce that saves cost saves time and it restores stories to tell restores heritage and it revitalize a negative side of the city a lot of times old buildings are neglected if you read about Bilbao effect so that's what happened to Bilbao it was already struggling with unemployment and then Frank Gehry came, you know, with his fancy uh, titanium clad museum. And now Bilbao is more vibrant than ever. So that's the power of architecture, right? And power of adaptive reuse. Okay, so how do we do it? Um, I am grateful that my practice have done almost eight adaptive reuse projects of different typologies. I just want to show you how diverse it can be. Like, you know, a house can be something totally unexpected. For example, this is a bungalow, two-story residential turned into a library. And this is a water tank, water tank structure. This is the building before. This whole um, building is located in a water treatment facility in Penang. So this whole top floor is a whitewashing tank. It's like an industrial building. And all these internal spaces are labs, facility, you know, none of it are office space. But the client had this clever idea. Can you help us insert office space in the structure? Which is what we did. We came in and then if you look closely, all these are windows where it was just open uh, column legs and beams. And how did we treat this because over the years the building go through different phase of renovation upgrade this up here up here and then i call it looking like a transformer building because it's, it's quite chaotic so we are glad that the client agreed on our easy idea of having a screen this was in 2016 
way before uh, COVID when everyone was wearing a mask. So I, I, I saw the idea of a view mask and to kind of like integrate the whole chaotic forms and proportion of the building. There's no other way to save this, I told the client, but there's a way to uh, kind of like unify the old and new. Okay. And then uh, there's also another residential house where we were asked to turn it into a memorial center, like a place of worship for Soka Gakai is a Japan-based uh, Buddhist uh, religious group. And another old house, um, Penang has a lot of old house because if you, you read up on our history, you know. So this was abandoned at the hill slope. Um, the client heard that we were rescuing old buildings with great effect and then we started getting called to like really uh, complex uh, problems. So what do you do with this? You know, we were questioned and then we decided that it would be a great for a visitor gallery. Some of you visited the place last year and this is a, a great viewing deck looking out to uh, Penang. We also did the interior design uh, and also the exhibition curator for Penang uh, Visitor Gallery. Uh, the gallery talks about the train, the hill, uh, the flora and fauna, and the heritage bungalow. So, um, and, and when we were working on the same Penang Hill, another owner called us up, you know, since you're coming up here every two weeks, you know, can you check out on my old house? And we also work on um, converting this into a luxury retreat. So I think this is the same house that Asia and your, your friends visited last year. So before and after, okay, just a very quick um, show that how a few minimal strokes make a lot of difference. This is the original, um, the timber flooring, we remove and sand down and let it expose <coughs> to its true color. And that was the most, uh, the biggest ticket, of course, in the whole expenses of this. Uh, and we, we were very careful on not to come down with a, a very heavily colorful uh, interior design. We went with a very sophisticated um, elegance. Okay. So those were a very quick run through of the diversity of what can be, you know, you, you should be asking why not, you know, a house can be this, a house can be that. Okay, so I call this a showcase project because um, I'm just going to go through a little bit of the journey and the process. Hopefully you guys can learn a thing or two. Um, think of this as your real project, okay? Uh, think of this as when tomorrow when you start work, you are handed this project, how would you do it? And that's my purpose of, you know, kind of like, putting up the whole process of uh, narrative. So the brief was designing a library without books. Comparatively, what is library without books? Okay, what are the elements that you know in the library? Books, bookshelves, uh, archive, this conventional library, a lot of space used for books, sorting, checking, borrowing, returning, so the state government had limited budget and they had a site identified and they say, why don't we take out all the books? Because we can't afford a big space. They can't afford such a big budget. Can we just focus on the reading space? Put all the books online, on cloud. So um, we work with an uh, IT partner and we work out brilliantly, a library without books. That's the first purpose built uh, in Penang and the building identified is uh, almost 200 year old and uh, is abandoned and in, in, in not a very good shape. The site sits one acre on empty land. It's beautiful trees, shadows. Uh, this is at first floor looking down. So this is my first site um, visit. You can hear birds chirping from the trees a sense of calm. And I want to share with you, when you go out next time to work um, and in your site visit, try to conceptualize your idea on the spot there and then, which is what I always do. Because nothing better to get your ideas on site. So immediately during my first visit there, the whole idea is 
it's such a great vibe, such a strong garden vibe with trees around. So immediately I made some mental notes, keep the trees, keep the shadow, let the birds stay and create a library in the park. I mean, it can be, it can sound like a tagline, but it is an honest process that it just happened in one site visit. And from that on is go back to office, work out, draw up, what do you do? How do you do this library in the park? So that's the old house. We kind of like call it old mansion, two story, meaning we have to restore, preserve the grand old lady. And the client say, we need more reading space. We want to provide free reading space for the students. So we reckon at two new messing, um, we were very clear on our direction. We wanted to have the focus on the mansion and whatever the new annex has to be pared down. I, I remember the design process was very quick in two weeks time and it's, it's decision one, two, three, and just all go. So the client took in this idea pretty well and uh, one messing, two floor, we call it the new annex and this will become uh, the hall. So, you know, we had to do this visual thing so that clients can understand. And that's like brilliant. They say, okay, let's go ahead. And then we proceeded to draw this. This is a good old SketchUp. This is my early years of practice. Uh, we don't use fancy Revit at that time yet, but uh, we were all really fast and good on uh, SketchUp. And we made sure our SketchUp is fully accurate. So this is the components of a library. Now, a library that you always know may not have this many variety of use. And I want to share with you that when you are an architect of the project, you are the creator. So never let your client contain your ideas because the client never stop you from giving suggestion, giving extra value um, uh, spaces. So what we persuaded the client is, why not we add a hall and then get a cafe here and an all day restaurant and then park in a children play area and then keep this lawn empty like an events hall, events uh, space and then keep Wisdom Street like an open natural ventilated uh, like a public ramp. So the whole vision is why not create this library like a community hub, a place where everyone can be the entire day, the whole family, a place for all ages. So dream big. All right, when you get a project, first thing you must do is you start to daydream. You start to put down what is your ideal wish list. Don't care about the cost first, okay? Just go as high as you can. And then that's, that's how it happened to us. We say, okay, this is going to be like the best library ever. And, and yet, um, we wanted to treat this project like our first and very last, okay? Very last means you want to do your best. So the story is this. As all mentioned, is a, uh, it has a few of the bungalows. It's part of a school compound. Some of the uh, students who visited the land last year will have understood the context. So there's another old bungalow that was the first phase, the first digital library, the first phase. And this second phase is the one that state government agreed to put in more fund to build a new annex. So we were very mindful of this whole uh, relationship of phase one, phase two. Uh, this is probably textbook to you, but uh, I just want to show you how really faithful the textbook uh, 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 lessons can bring to this result. So what we did is we wanted this new annex to face the first phase in a full parallel. Like if you go on site, it's, it's, nine, it's parallel to the old building, the phase one. And then uh, we recognize that this is the diagonal orientation of the existing building, we can't touch that. And hence, we, we deliberately rotate this hall because it could have been here, it, it could have been just two story, it could have been the whole empty space, a whole annex. But we really wanted to have this kind of a embracing sense of uh, welcoming. So on the roof plan, again, notice that this number two, central lawn. Now, every time we present to the state government, we get this question. Why, why, you, why is this empty, you know? 
we, we get more reading space here. So we, we really persuaded Fort Hart to keep the central space. There's a reason I want to show you. We knew the site very well because we were going almost every week. We studied the shadow patterns and we knew with this tall trees on site, none, no trees were chopped during the construction. We knew that this whole area was shaded during the morning and during the evening, we saw that this building cast a portion of it as well. So we immediately had this vision where it's brilliant to stay out here until 11 because we were going there, you know, at least I was going there, you know, standing under the tree. So at this point, everyone think that, you know, I'm, I'm obsessed with the project, but um, so the layout, if you're keen to see the layout. So there's a lot of thought being it because this project is completed in 10 months. So we knew 10 months is not a long time to play with. So when we designed this, it was, I, I brought in a lot of my high rise, um, skills and knowledge, how to build high rise fast track. And I say, okay, it has to be regimented. It has to be the same uh, column grid, this 7.5, and then this 15, and then you buy the same portal frame and you go from left to right. So it's that bullish kind of attitude from day one. Okay. So, um, because I want to share with you this so that you can know that effort comes, it brings uh, a different result. So what we did is, this is an existing uh, seven quarters. In Georgetown, there's always a mansion and there's always an uh, annex for the servants to, to stay and uh, work there. So what we did is we created this public realm uh, to have like a buffer, but yet to make sure the whole development uh, has this easy connectivity and workability. Now, upstairs, we wanted natural ventilation um, and natural lighting. That's very important. Uh, I my earliest memory of uh, digital uh, library is always coal artificial light. Okay, and I always want a library that reads under natural lighting. So we made sure this was addressed in the new annex. We we placed a linear skylight here, a void, and large windows from this side. Now mindful that. East is here, west is here. So in Malaysia, the sun moves this way, right? So that's where we recognize that the trees could cast shadows in here. And this vertical louvers, if you are big in green design, then sun shading is your passive way, passive design strategy. I love passive design strategy because it costs less. And a lot of our government projects don't have uh, you know, fancy budget. So this is the facade. Uh, old and new, and to to be really certain of shadow um, on site, we made a model. I had my interns make the model, and my interns said, "Why not just test in the rendering? You know, I'm sure Revit can do simulation." I said, "No, no, must do model." So we did a model. We went to site, <coughs> watch how the shadow occurs, and. This is to actual orientation. North is here, east is there. And we document it and we were quite happy to, so we are quite confident that when this is built, this wisdom street will be shaded morning and afternoon. And from that model, we became more confident. We built full detail drawing using SketchUp and we made sure it looked good on every angle. During construction, uh, it was fast track. So how do we do it? We recommend to the builder to have three teams. One to save the old building, one to build the new annex, another one to build the restaurant at the back. So it's like three projects in one compressed uh, job. In, um, in Penang, we have a lot of problems with termite. Uh, termite loves wood structures like this. And for this building, we discovered that you know a lot of these are damaged, and the structure engineer uh, decided to replace the timber flooring with steel. So this is drawn by our team. So architects, because of my high rise experience, we we had to coordinate steel works as well. So when we were doing this, I, I worked with the engineer. Their initial cut was they they have no um, sense of 
sizes and proportion yet in the first cut of structure planning. And we went back, negotiated, I said, okay, uh, could you, these are all RHS rectangle hollow section. So we negotiated with them, meaning we were designing the floor with the engineers. Why? Because it's important to retain that characteristic <coughs> of the original timber uh, structures. Okay, so why am I telling you this? If you could learn as much structure as you can in your UST, because when you go out, if you could negotiate, I'm not asking you to do what the engineers do, but you need to know how the, the structural elements will either make your building look good or you will just turn the whole thing upside down. Okay. And so we were really careful, meticulous about everyone's work in the team, the M&E, the CNS, you know, we were making sure everything is well uh, integrated. And this is the outcome. So we restored the whole um, mansion back to its former glory. We've added the new annex. If you remember the SketchUp view and this, so we always tend to compare them side by side. And, and we are glad that it turned out right. So these are the shadow patterns from the morning sun, right? Remember from the east. And because this is the central lawn that we are most proud of, I call it, you know, uh, the garden, the shade without trees, because the trees are a bit far away, but because of their height, uh, it's, it's an amazing vibe to see it. But what is happening today is the security guard treats this so sacred that they don't allow to walk on grass. But I was like, it's, it's all wrong, you know. So I have to, you know, persuade the security guard. No, you let people sit there. They are meant to sit there and enjoy the, the trees. But and I think the cats are enjoying themselves now. <laughs> so you, you see cats in the library. Uh, so now, old and new. Few rules we all must remember. Uh, to me, the old elements has to be the main player, the main actor. So the new building, somehow, to me, it has to be pared down, a little bit pushed to the back to give uh, a bit of a focus on the old building. Okay, And in the new annex, we created this uh, corridor walkway. Um, in a tropical climate, you, you have heavy rain, you have sun, you have, uh, when you come, when you have sun, you have shade. So Tada Ando is my hero when I was in a UST. So I always dream of doing this. And this is the same spot, different light. And uh, so try this because it's not, not difficult. Uh, just need a little bit of effort and uh, dedication in detailing. Uh, we were also doing the interior design. We were everywhere. And uh, I guess this was like the biggest project, small scale, but the biggest project in the office at that time. Uh, these are my kids. And when I was working on this project, they are here. I think now they are taller than me. Um, the, the joke about this is I use my children's height. I, we, we get them, trace their height on the wall, and then we translate them into the sticker to the playroom glass wall. And then, interestingly, when it's printed, when it's done, I send them there. Can you please stand next to your silhouette? You know, they, they are, they've grown two inch taller. <laughs> so. But it's all about passion in your work. Okay, then remember the whole um, idea about shadow. So we introduced this simple linear skylight all the way. It's diagonally to the sun pattern, right? The sun up, the so sun comes up this way. You have to do your linear skylight this way. So that I want the lines to appear. So it's, it's pretty much heavily calculated and, um, you know, we were... This all worked out really well. And so we were really happy that uh, natural lit spaces, checkbox tick, you know, and we were happy that the void works out well. Uh, sun were coming in. So some of you will have remembered this place. Uh, but now the beauty is in Penang, the sun rise up only at um, at the top of the building around noon, 12 to 1. So these shadows only appear 12 to 1. You go to 4 o'clock, you don't see it. And, and I like it, like it, it's an interesting feature. And then friends call me and say, oh, uh, uh, can I go to the library? I say, okay, please go at 12 o'clock, you know. And you know when you go upstairs. And um, 
So we, a bonus that we found was the text that we put on the glass wall. Now, I didn't expect the words to be bounced off to the ground, okay? Some laws of physics, um, but it did. And we, we were quite excited that it became like a bonus for us. And again, this word thing on the ground, it doesn't appear anytime at the right timing, at the right angle, just at the right intensity. When you are lost in the library and cannot think of a solution, the word comes out and say thing again. <laughs> and then in a while it goes disappear. So I, I thought, wow, that's great, you know. I, I didn't expect this. So and this is how the actual is. So some guys on site was trying to explain the physics, you know, the sun rays bounce into the glass because it's a tempered glass and then it comes back. And because there's a film in the laminated temp tempered glass and it bounces off. And then because of the film uh, of the text, it comes back to the floor. So I was like, okay, that's brilliant. So it opened to really good um, feedback uh, communities because it is free, free for Malaysian. So students were finally thrilled to have fast speed internet. They could have aircon, it's all free, walk in and study all you want. And uh, when it was open in 2019, I think kids were queuing up 8 a.m. So, you know, that suddenly reminds myself and I want to share with you that this is the power of what architecture can do. You know, if you are doing community buildings, think of who the building will be used. So there you go. Any of you in this? Anyone? Yeah, good to see you. Okay. So but these guys were great because I remember it was raining. Yeah. And, and I realized you guys are not afraid of rain. So good. And uh, yeah, you guys tested the, the bay window seat. Okay. So we're on some time schedule. Second showcase for it, that's digital library. So shortly after um, completing digital library, we were commissioned to work on uh, Harmony Center um, because now this whole two projects show you one thing is every project always come with a problem. <coughs> and as architects, especially when you're in school, in university, you start to remember this. We are not just artists, we are problem solvers. We are here to solve problem. You have to go into the meeting room and say, I'm here to solve problem. Because otherwise you get frustrated. You'll be like, why is my project having so many problems? Because that's who we are. We are here to solve problems. So for this, um, the state government showed us the problem. The problem was there's a lot of uh, religious buildings, a lot of Chinese temple, Indian temple, and Penang is multicultural and uh, you have a lot of uh, association and these are representing all of the locations asking for funding asking for funding to build the same thing the, to build an events hall everyone wants an events hall so in georgetown the temples tend to be small structure so they always seek funding to build an annex and the, the state literally uh, don't have that much budget to serve everyone and they came up with this brilliant idea the idea actually came from the the state government they say why not you know if you think of co-working space where one office shared by 10 20 companies share the same meeting room share the pantry share the receptionist right so so the state government got creative and said why not i we built one hall for all of the religious groups to share. So like a space sharing concept. And we were commissioned uh, after working on digital library and we felt brilliant, you know, one hall for everyone, meaning we have a, a really big cross section of users coming in. So we name it um, Penang Harmony Center. We work close to And it's all to promote peace and harmony. Uh, the whole component is now, remember when you start a project, always have a strong vision. Always identify what is the purpose of this building. And write this at the very beginning because halfway through you lose sight and, and you will forget what is the real purpose. So 
four purpose old building empty and uh, you know dilapidated so this is what it looks like in the inside a timber structure and a two story more of like elevated structure and it's on the one acre empty lot now the existing building shows on the screen how do you add a new hall okay and again we were still young practice we were really hard working we wanted to try as many options as possible you know how would you add a new hall in the old building with an empty in a big lawn right you know which one would you do so we proposed option one whether in the front no whether here i said no and then going around there's trees there's trees here option five maybe but it's still having trees at this side option six you know the client said why not option six you know let's let's save time let's just build in front you know one of the suggestion on the meeting room i said no um i think we settled on building the hall next to the existing building because i have a certain uh, value about respecting old buildings like how we respect our old grandmother okay old buildings to me is like old grandma so when you take picture with old grandma you're always like grandma you, you stand here right you, you you don't go in front well that's that's um how asian values is so i i translate that to my architecture we said okay build next to it and um we we start to build in the capacity it's pretty straightforward the brief says uh, restore the old building add a new annex okay and then again the the rest we are all up to our own benchmark we wanted natural lighting again we wanted natural ventilation all passive uh, strategies the construction cost there was a really low cap to it 2.5 uh, million ringgit um you you can translate divide 500 so 500000 usd Okay, 500. Um, construction progress. Uh, this this was on the tight schedule as well. So what we did was we convert. This was a old office. So we convert this into like an administrative uh, center with a hall sitting up to 180 pegs. Now, old and new. Existing building, and the new hall. So what we did is, again. A very strong respect to the old uh, some rules that we lay to to ourselves the new must not be taller than the new cannot be taller than the old okay and it's really so straightforward but we we felt there's no other way because that's how we want the whole new annex to uh, emerge and blend harmoniously with the existing mansion Okay, and if you are into passive lighting strategies is how we did it now we did some surgery persuaded the contractor to change the roofing sheet It's a jack roof two layer jack roof change the solid roofing sheet put in a clear roofing and then instantly it became a clear skyline it sounds easy now because i i, I filtered out all the struggle uh, of course they had to clean up the ceiling we removed the ceiling we get the central skylight and then we retain all the windows and the new annex uh, is fully natural lit during the day we have this element called light shelves if you do um, foundation and building uh, lighting design you have light shelves so we made sure light shelves bounce in to have illumination at higher level at eye level lights come in as well okay so lighting done then ventilation so what do we do with ventilation cross ventilation in tropical climate now the original house is more like a malay architecture where the house is elevated and we knew uh, breeze will cross through that's how it cools the air in the big at uh, the bottom and then the hot air will rise up through the jack roof so we we literally restored the jack roof uh, because we knew it's an air well and it's fully functional so we never um, there to enclose it so it's not air conditioned so you visit this building in Penang then you see that it's natural ventilated in the middle zone for that reason so the client felt in a tropical climate it's only practical to have air conditioned and because we have already formulated the strategy to have natural lighting 
I refuse to have flat ceiling. I refuse to have cassette, whatnot. So we persuaded the M&E to design a plenum box. One supply, one return. Then I realized this is what we always do in a high rise. And again, it's like, I'm using high rise skills doing small uh, rescue building. So I let you decide whether that's a good thing or, or uh, a good thing that you can remember. So for the hall, um, passive lighting man, we use the sun. Because in Penang, we have we are like sunshine through the through the whole year, you know, and uh, because that's where I felt is it will be a waste if we don't use the sun. Uh, we introduce skylights at every interval, and these ceiling panels were also designed to full zero wastage. If it comes by one point two by six hundred, then one piece it is. So I want to show you the power of um, knowing your materials early on. If you know about your materials, when you design your column grid, you plan for zero wastage from day one. Okay. So, pick one through the other section. I'll show you the completed projects, uh, the completed photos. So, this is the old and the new. And uh, we are very mindful to pare down the roof tone. This is a bituminous roofing sheet. Uh, this is all restored to its full structure. This is new, and this is the natural lighting uh, skylight that we designed. And um, colors were toned, pared down. Um, what we did with the flooring is what we did the same thing for the project in Penang Hill. We removed the varnish, and that's that's the whole beauty of you know we bringing in the honest character of the material, the skylight that we spoke about. And this is definitely one of the, the elements that we are most proud of because it took great coordination work with the contractor. And um, this building received a lot of visitors, a lot of media reporters, and when they came in, uh, they, they were expecting this to be artificial lights, but they are not. So at the opening event, somebody asked me to, can you switch off the lights? That was like 11 a.m. And I was speechless because how do I tell them that I can't switch off these skylights, you know? <laughs> so, but then there's a lesson to me because if you are designing a hall and if you are so bold about celebrating natural light, what happens when somebody asks for like dark team because the performers wanted a dark and then they wanted a spotlight. And I, I said, I can't do that because we, we didn't design for a, a blackout. So that's the whole story. And um, the windows, I'm sure you have seen this a lot in uh, buildings in the 60s and the 40s. So, uh, we did this, I call it the accordion wall, one solid and one window, folded in, uh, addressed to the east-west sun. And we get really gentle illumination during the day. So um, the project won for one goal for adaptive reuse based on this whole careful integration. Uh, again, I'm like a tree hugger. I say no trees are cut. So all trees are retained. And uh, the project open to multiple uh, groups of religions uh, coming together. And uh, I think, and when I did Pecha Kucha, the whole idea is to celebrate architecture. And whenever we complete one building, we do like a housewarming session and then we call everyone and this is how it looks like at night. Um, because remember, these are all natural light. So at night, it doesn't function as light. So what we did was we insert a very inexpensive T8, you know, those tubes, fluorescent tubes, um, LED tubes, and then it glows up the whole space. Very low budget and... Uh, uh, highly impactful at the end. So the recognition that came from the project. Um, last one. Uh, so from Penang Digital Library, the state leaders from Kedah visited and uh, they, they were really happy and they liked what they saw and they um, wanted to do the same concept in the state of Kedah. And interestingly, there was an old building on site as well an old mansion, a two-story residential. Uh, 
at the first site visit, this is a memorial for Tunku Abdul Rahman. Um, if you read our um, history, father of our independence. And what we did was we removed all the dark tinting on the windows, remove all the unnecessary internal walls, add on a new annex. I'm not going to repeat the whole story of book library without books because this is again the same uh, template at the state request. Okay, let's do one more. And this is the old mansion. I'll just quickly show you how we are always very careful of all elements uh, and keep them into a contemporary color blend. Um, the location of this is interesting that because in Penang, I suggested library in the park. But in Kedah, there was a real park next to the library. So uh, the, the real story is I persuaded the client that, can we do something else? You know, I would like to you know, do something else. Like we don't need to do a library in the park. But uh, the client said, no, we have a real park. So we are kind of like, okay, then we, we, can't, we can't say anything else. But so that's how it became. This is also library in the park because there's a real park across the road, like another acre of full uh, public park. So the new annex for uh, Kedah Digital Library, we were a bit more bold. Uh, some question, this seems really modern, but we felt that uh, this is a bigger site and we, we felt we could uh, experiment with a bit more uh, clean volume of space. This is a hall and this is the amphitheater seats. Uh, from Penang Digital Library, we got a bit more experimental, a bit more brave. Uh, you know, everyone sees this in pin interest. So we say, oh, we have to do it, please, you know. And uh, so the client agreed and allowed us to design this without blinds, without curtains. So I was nervous about that, but uh, it turned out all right. Again, careful placement of uh, morning sun and afternoon. Uh, so it became a few of like must do, you know. And you know my designers or my indoors they all oh, must have natural lighting. So that that's became like our signature uh, mission. Like I said, because in Penang, in Malaysia, the sun is free, and I always feel buildings do not work hard enough to utilize the sunlight in the building. And what we did here is, um, I wanted this connection, visual connection to the park across the street is a real park. So this is the foyer before you enter the hall. And uh, we made sure this whole visual connectivity is in place. At night, this is how the amphitheater glows up like a lantern. Yeah, and uh, of course, we, we also went in for adaptive reuse. Um, really happy that we got recognized. Our PEM is a Malaysia standard of uh, AIA, right? Okay, so if we have time, um, this is like latest. We recently won a competition for a old market, you know, like a market selling vegetable, fish and meat in uh, Penang. And uh, we won first prize. Uh, do you guys want to see? We did a video for, this is the same video that uh, we presented during the final judging. So this again, another uh, adaptive reuse. Uh, story. The whole building is quite significant. I'll let you join the video a bit. What is now? And there's an old building uh, that you
is if you go out from Canada, now we are like so the whole narrative is a marketing plan for the industry. And they start holding vegetable fish. And then but by 12, by 1, your business will fall slow and the better. That's why the guys are all just standing still. The guys don't move in landscape. So, okay. So, uh, that's that's who I am. That's what we do. Um, you know, we became like the practice of rolling in academia and practice in one. Uh, and I would recommend everyone to travel when you can because uh, go out there, see the world in during your university. Because when you come back, you can still continue learn. So this is um, some of the trips that I brought my students to Singapore, uh, to Johor, meet with friends. Uh, this is an award-winning architect in Malaysia. So last few slides. But I'll be speaking tomorrow also, but um, my, my personal um, kind of like reminders, you know, always be curious and, uh, as an architect. I imagine all of you here are architects. If you're a designer, same, you know. Be a child, always ask this whole five W and one H. You know, you, we get this in school. And um, be original because from the projects that I've shared, we were so keen to, to go all out and, and, you know, come up with original ideas. And uh, add on to the whole uh, works that I've shown. Uh, right now, we have managed to complete up to 10 adaptive reuse projects in Penang in Kedah and um, ongoing we are completing an archaeology center maybe if you visit in soon this year if it completes June. then June yeah. okay maybe you might be able to see the archaeology museum and <coughs> yeah that's me if you're on LinkedIn you can find me then uh, last one believe in the power of architecture because you know if I can travel all the way here to speak to you you know I'm sure you, you will do many great things if you dream high and you know write it down today after this write down what's your goal and then I'll definitely see you doing good things okay likewise to guys on zoom um, I think that's my final last slide are we on good time thank you guys <laughs> Amy, our MC. I guess, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, so we certainly have time for maybe, you know, five, ten minutes, maybe 15 minutes of questions if, if you guys have time still. Um, so I'd like to open it up um, either on Zoom and or in the room here. Questions? <laughs> You're like, excellent. <laughs> Um, you, you talked a lot about kind of like treating materials honestly, um, and I was wondering before, like you have a lot of like really clean, nice, nice white um, exterior materials. Are are those intended to age kind of in like gray with rain and, and moisture, or or is there like a maintenance schedule for that, or like are those like what was kind of your philosophy there? Oh, the walls. Yeah, for like kind of material expression across time with like this new thing that then is like situated against the old. Uh, for the government projects that I shared, 
those comes with really limited budget. So in Penang, uh, almost across the board, we use uh, paint on the plastic wall. And, uh, you know, but to answer a question, you know, if you have the budget, use stone finish if you want the materials to age over time. And uh, sometimes we use uh, cement spray uh, tiles, so that can work as well. And uh, of course, this whole commitment to honest materials. Sometimes it, it gets us in trouble because we can't afford marble, you know. I want marble, but you know, the budget doesn't allow. So I'm guilty of it. You, know, you can go to my buildings in Penang and then you, you check, you know, this is not real, you know. But uh, there are times we, we had to, but otherwise, of course, it would be great if we can use all 100% materials. Okay. Thanks. Your work, so you started doing like pretty much, from what I can tell, only new construction, and now you do a lot of based on old construction. So, I mean, the advantage of new construction is you don't have to worry about removing a lot of stuff, yeah. I guess, as an architect. Um, but I guess, what's are there any advantages that you found of working with older buildings um, as opposed to newer construction? Uh, of course, given a choice, we will definitely prefer new construction. Why? I can give you a few advantage of new construction. You don't have to go to site so often. In Penang, it's hot and it's, you know, you sweat and all that, but you don't have to go to site, but you have proper drawings and they build. You know? mm -hmm. And then they, they have less surprises because it's just an empty site. You start from a brown field. No? <coughs> and the number three is you have less um, structural constraint because mm -hmm. it's empty. So reverse wise to answer, um, and when we work with old buildings, we definitely have to prepare ourselves for surprises. Rip out the ceiling and something else. We didn't cost for it. So, um, what's the whole beauty of old buildings is we get to preserve stories to tell. Um, so this is what real stories are like. The buildings that we preserve in the digital library. Uh, until now, once in a while, I meet people who say, oh, you know, I used to go there, my teacher used to stay there, I used to have barbecue there. So, but I don't know about how important these stories are to you, but these are intangible heritage that are quite necessary for uh, the younger generation to understand the past of a city. And, and, um, and then it gives you a character where uh, money can't buy because if it's already 200 year old you can't suddenly say you want to buy up 200 years of history so we have um, also all a bus depot in Penang that is transformed into an art center now mm. and and I, to me the biggest um, plus of saving old buildings is stories to tell in historical past and I'm sure you have a lot of buildings here in, in Moscow that that does that Okay, does that answer your question? Yeah, totally. Thank you. Okay. Okay. All good. Um, based on the restrictions that um, kind of preserving older buildings have, like a lot of the times they need uh, maintenance, especially on their um, foundations or the structure. Would you say um, adaptive reuse would eventually be more cost efficient than doing a project entirely from scratch? Yes, you definitely save on uh, lower ground structure. You know, you, you literally save the beer and then you prop up and then you're ready to go. It does save costs in that sense. Um, and if you're clever, then if the roof is fairly in repairable condition, then you already save half of the cost of trying to do new roofing. Um, and I, I think that's very clever of you to see. Are you a, a student or a lecturer? No, I'm a student. Okay. I appreciate that you, you kept giving me this nod of approval throughout my talk. <laughs> yeah. I was like, at least she is agreeing with me. <laughs> but okay, I keep going. Because I'm checking all of you when I speak. So, okay, but everyone is with me. But like, yeah, I, I, I saw that. Mm. <laughs> so I was a bit worried that is she a lecturer? That mm, she seems to be agreeing. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> okay. Uh, I remember you. Yeah. <laughs> You're still here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. um, you you talk a lot about like your principles and like the thing like being true to yourself in terms of like honesty and like, respect mm -hmm. to materials, which like I find really admirable. 
So don't see that a lot in the room, especially around here. Um, oh, don't say that. Well, <laughs> I mean, we are on Zoom, okay? Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I mean, it is hard to find, like, truth, truth be told. But like, and you gave some good examples in terms of like times when you convince the client to kind of be more authentic to yourself and your design choices. I'm just curious if there's been times when there's been a disagreement with the client that like they're really not like willing to let go of and you've kind of had to work around that and like yeah. what that was like. Yeah. Um, you guys went to the digital library, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and now listening to the talk, because I, I never showed the plans. Yeah. So did it feel complete after hearing the whole process? Yeah, I, yeah. I was, um, to answer your question, the part where we wanted to keep the lawn empty, so we, we had to we had to handle that feedback a few rounds of meeting, and um, also on the part where we wanted to create the skylight in the Harmony Center, um, and in the Kedah Library was the part of the amphitheater looking out to the garden through clear glass with no blinds with no curtains. So how do I handle it? Multiple skills of you know strategy. Uh, first round, of course, I never argue with a client. First round, we, we attempt to persuade. And it's still not convinced, I buy time. Don't quote me, okay, but now I'm recorded. But uh, <laughs> there's many ways of being persuasive with the client, but you have to see who your clients are. But uh, one is patience. I can tell you it's about patience. And, try to speak in a language where they can understand. So um, digital library, we had to build the model because it finally got everyone to imagine what it was. So that was easy to, to kind of but get the buy-in. So build a model, get more drawings to explain. Uh, and then when, and a lot of times it's timing. So for Kedah library, we gave the whole rendering, but the, con the clients was not convinced. Maybe you should put in the blinds because I'm not sure Penang or Kedah tropical sun can handle. It might be very hot, you know. So, and then I'd say we don't have any more budget for that. <laughs> and so it's okay. So, and then I suggest maybe we should do a bit of value engineering. Maybe find the budget. Maybe I'll put back the blinds. Okay, right. We think. Next meeting, next meeting, next sidewalk, the blinds is still not there. So what happened to this? No more blinds? I uh, haven't found a budget yet. Wait and see. And then <laughs> the building goes up, sidewalk. So still no, no blinds? Uh, for now, no. Wait and see. So I keep buying time. Then I can't sleep at night because I really want the whole vision without blinds. Because I, I felt with blinds, it's a bit cluttered. But we calculated that the sun rises up on the right, and we have the baffles, the sun shading. Uh, and right, just when the glass comes up, the envelope comes up, we bring the client to walk through. He's still a little bit concerned that might be heat. And I was like, maybe let's let it complete. And if it's still warm, then we do the blinds. Okay, so it's like a gamble. I don't know whether it's gamble or not, but so eventually it worked out well when it's all fully functional with the aircon in. It's comfortable and say, okay, forget about the blinds. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you do it. I guess you never argue with the client, okay? So, uh, so sometimes I, 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 I felt that my, my company name Beta, we, I'm never the alpha person in the room. As, remember as architects, the, you know, there will never be a project without your client. So you respect your client with all you can, and then there's this whole ego of us wanting to do what we want, right? So you have to be careful and be persuasive about it. And if the meeting one still no, maybe you need to persuade with more drawings. And maybe at that early stage, it's too early to see. There's always a right time to come back. So don't give up, okay? Same thing for your studio create studio progress that's something you believe in it and sometimes at that moment you know your message just doesn't get through you want to try again then come back with more drawing okay does that help you're so, going to graduate soon uh undergrad <laughs> and 
So we have a Zoom question for you. Uh, this is from Shristi. She's asking, what slash how do you consider different aspects from history or historic stories when you do adaptive reuse projects, apart from natural light, heating, and ventilation, which you showed very beautifully? So the question wants to know, how do you consider different aspects from history or historic stories when you do adaptive okay. reuse projects? Okay. Um, in the digital library, now we, we knew very well it used to be a house and uh, we could uh, gather from the room layout. Upstairs is bedroom, both, both sides. Downstairs, one is living room, one is dining room, one is kitchen. And um, to, I, I hope this answers the question, but we, we felt we wanted to have a bit of homage to what it used to be. So you go to the digital library, the living room has reading space, but with sofa, living room furniture. And then we, I, I felt, oh, very convenient. This is for the, for the uh, guys in silver hair, you know, all the grandma and grandfather will be there at the living room zone. So we call it the living, uh, the reading room in the living area. And then on the left side is a dining area. So we again interpret that dining table becomes the reading space. So at times we have that kind of a, a respect and a connection to the past use. And otherwise, uh, we are careful on uh, the proportions of the existing building, bring it to the new one. Okay? Maybe, I don't know if there's time, if there's one more question, maybe we'll wrap it up. If not, but no pressure to ask a question. Is there a chart oh. after the bedroom? What? Oh. You've got the question there? Maybe I'll I missed. How long did it usually take you about to finish an entire project? Uh, average from design stage. Um, design stage probably six months. Uh, projects of the scale, like this kind of scale, not this scale, uh, about Penang Digital with 10 months, average 12 months, one year to two years. Um, it, it's good that you ask this question now. If you are a graduate looking for a fastest track of experience, and you, you join small practice that does small things. Okay. Now, when I mentioned I did eight towers in eight years, it, it didn't mean one tower a year. Uh, the eight towers, I think I had like two generations. The first generation, the first batch was four towers at one time. So it takes about four years to build a tower. So four years, including planning, permission, and construction. So if you are doing your professional license, I'm sure you have a lot of experience. So I would say the same uh, advice to my student. If you are going all out on you know, hitting the fastest track in getting your license, join a small practice, do small projects well, because you get to see A to Z in the shorter span. If you work on a you know, big firm's fancy project in New York, Towers, you have to wait up to four or five years and then because you want to go through you want to go through concept now concept is only 15 percent of the whole lifespan 15 percent then you have your authority and you have your tender right and then you have your site construction then you have your defects so you want to do all that in this kind of cute projects and then do it well do it with all your passion and your, your report for your uh, license report, uh, it, it will be really detailed as well. Okay? So, and Have you found more enjoyment in skyscraper design or in a more smaller project? Oh, this is dangerous because um, <laughs> I have to confess that I've come full circle uh, this year with commission to work on the high rise. So I've kind of like gone back one feet into my roots. Uh, so I still enjoy both. And the fact that public buildings are great because you know the users are, you know, regular folks like you and I and like taxpayers and, you know, that, that's a different ball game. And when you work on uh, a skyscraper, it's all about dollar and cents. It's about efficiency. It's all about, you know, uh, money, 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 and, you know, no vestiges and uh, making sure your car park is efficient, and it's another leap altogether. 
Um, but never be calculative in the sense where, no, I don't do old buildings because, you know, I just want to do high rise. So my story, my message is do everything that comes along your way. So when you're young, uh, it's too early to decide, too early to kind of like stick to one uh, typology because as you go through the whole spectrum, I, I felt like, see, when I design my high rise, uh, residential high rise now, I put elements of resort and hospitality. And then when they say, oh, we need uh, uh, like shops, I put in my mall experience because it, it, will, it will complete you. So be clever when you go out there looking for a job, uh, strategize, and then try to do different jobs in the shortest way possible which is why I end up working 12 hours a day in Singapore and I volunteer Saturday, Sunday, because Saturday, Sunday, I'll go to other teams. That's how I end up uh, helping the planning teams working on competition. So I have no life in my first four years. So <laughs> I don't know that's sad or what, but yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much.